Good morning, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to open today's event uh, on countering foreign interference, the challenges and opportunities it poses to the European Union. My name is Nadia Kovalčíková, and I'm a senior analyst on Transnational Security and co-director on countering foreign interference project in the EU Institute for Security Studies. A few days ago, the European Parliament voted on the latest report with overwhelming majority of the Special Committee on Foreign Interference in all democratic processes uh, in the European Union, including disinformation and the strengthening of integrity, transparency, and accountability in the European Parliament. This report calls, besides other things, for a coordinated EU strategy to counter foreign interference in all its forms. Recent initiatives from the EU, such as the EU's 2022 strategic compass and the new foreign information manipulation and interference, so-called FEMI toolbox, EAS Sharing and Analysis Center that was announced earlier this year, also expanding work of the EAS, uh, Strategic Communication Task Forces, the work of the European Commission, Council, and many other stakeholders, show that there is a lot to be done by many with a whole of society approach. As it was stated on Wednesday in the US Senate, uh, the, um, the environment of global information uh, public spheres is characterized by persistent asymmetric competition with authoritarian challengers. And all of this is taking place across at least 13 domains, such as diplomatic domains, political, economic, cyber, cultural, and information, and few more, uh, within the context of hybrid threats. This is the concept of the center of excellence of Helsinki and hybrid threats. And these domains are very comprehensive to show how how complex the issue of countering foreign interference, disinformation, in relation also to other attacks is. Therefore, um, our project uh, and the context of today uh, is to look for effective measures to counter malign influence aiming to undermine democratic processes and institutions as well as security and societal cohesion. And uh, this does not need to be only well coordinated, but also systematic, structural, tangible, sustainable, but also persistent as the competition uh, is persistent. Today's event, co-organized with the European University Institute, uh, is taking place within the context of a new country in foreign interference project funded by the EU's foreign policy instruments. It is a project to strengthen EU common security and defense policy capacities against FEMI. It was launched earlier this year and is implemented by the EU ISS with our university partners such as EUI, University Milano Bicocca, and University of Antwerp and in close cooperation with European External Action Service. Overall, the project aims to enable the EU to address short and medium term foreign policy needs and opportunities in and with non-EU territories by supportive innovative policies and innovations uh, and by deepening EU relations and dialogues. Forging alliances and partnerships in the field of FEMI is critical to succeed. While we heard yesterday at one of the panels that EU needs to listen more, and so do other powers that shape world politics, this project and growing number of others too shows that EU has been listening on several fronts and certainly in the field encountering foreign interference. Moreover, EU is also getting equipped to act more and more effectively, including with partners with concrete initiatives to build capacities and capabilities to counter FEMI. A healthy information space, both at home and in third countries, can in fact contribute to European security interests and enhance the security of third states, but may also help uphold a rule-based international order and democratic principles. But how would such cooperation and coordination between EU and third countries take form concretely? And how shall EU and its member states counter information manipulation effectively to protect democracy and security internally, while potentially assisting partner countries in related efforts? To address these questions and many more, I am delighted to give the floor to my colleagues and the distinguished panel for a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Nadia, for these introductory remarks, and please take your seat, as uh, we may also benefit from your expertise later uh, during the Q&A. My name is Giovanni Faleg. I'm a senior analyst and co-director of the Countering Foreign Interference Project uh, at the European Union Institute for Security Studies, and I have the pleasure, together with Rolf Niemeyer from the European University Institute School of Transnational Governance, to moderate this panel discussion, where we will try to 
untangle and have a better understanding of what, what the threat is concretely and what are the possible policy responses and also how to better coordinate uh, within the EU on crafting those responses. So I'm turning now to our speakers. And the first uh, question really to kickstart the discussion uh, is what are the actors and actions when we speak about uh, foreign information manipulation and interference? Uh, can you provide some concrete examples to you know, discuss what this is about in real terms and how is this threat manufactured? Uh, before we get into the response part. And maybe give the floor first to uh, Nika for your early comments. Thank you. Hello, good morning, everyone. I'm Nika Alexeyev, a research fellow with Digital Forensic Research Lab at Atlantic Council, focused on the Baltic states. Uh, and I've been working on the subject for the past six years. And ever, ever, ever since the reinvasion of Ukraine, we knew that information domain will also be the battleground. But what we didn't expect is that these so-called FEMI operations will be so sloppy. So let me illustrate with two cases. Uh, last summer, their uh, known, um, known mainstream media outlets started to noticing that their domains are spoofed. Someone else is pretending to be these media outlets. And these spoof domains, the links to the manufactured articles, started to appear on social media platforms, as Meta's Instagram, Facebook, but also Twitter and elsewhere. So this campaign, what it did, it went to these known mainstream media outlets, copied the source code, put it on their own web infrastructure, uh, bought domains that seemed like, like Welt, which is a very famous German media outlet, was Welt LTD, not Welt DE, but Welt LTD. And then a user, not suspecting anything, goes on Facebook and sees, oh, Welt writes something about, uh, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, lift the sanctions from Russia because it's hurting German economy. And so user clicks, gets on the false, media infrastructure. And the clever part is that only this one article, one page is forged because all of the other links are maintained the same. So if user reads the false article and decides to click around and see really Welt is uh, all of a sudden is advocating to lift Russian sanctions, this user would go to the real Welt.be. And if the user wouldn't notice this little detail in the URL, Done. I mean, this user will believe that Welt is advocating to lift the sanctions. Now to the part about this campaign being sloppy. We saw, uh, so we saw this uh, tendency, we reported it to Meta, and Meta ca came back with uh, over uh, 300 assets that they believed are part of this campaign. And so these assets were uh, many, not just uh, Facebook pages, but also Facebook accounts. But for Facebook pages, the only way they could really garner audience was with paying, paying for the content. So if before, let's go back to 2016, when uh, Trump and Hillary Clinton were competing, we remember the sock puppet accounts that garnered a lot of audience. They really built up their personas. Not the case with these accounts. These pages were created over a day all at the same time, not all, but there were clusters when they were created at the same time. Uh, the naming was very interesting. They used, uh, in most of the cases, the words open opinion in many languages. So it was German, French, Italian, also Latvian, and grammar mistakes. They were super distinct. <clears throat> so other, it was very bad language carrier or automatic translation that would mistranslate common expressions, let's say as they would be in Russian, to say Italian. And that was another identifier for it to be foreign interference campaign that the language was very bad. And uh, yeah, overall we saw that the campaign was executed sloppy. And uh, another campaign was on Telegram. I know I'm running over time. What I wanted to tell about the Telegram, um, the, the very, um, similar approach of basically uh, 
creating many similarly named Telegram accounts all over different language spaces, and not just European languages, but also Arab, Chinese, Japanese, so it was more global campaign. What was distinctive is, again, they did not pretend. They did not put effort into authenticity. They outright told that we are a volunteer network of anonymous Telegram accounts who want to spread the word about the truth the way Russia sees it. And again, language quality was bad. The content dissemination was centralized. So there were centralized Telegram accounts that adapted videos, dubbed them with text, again, in poor language quality or subtitles, oftentimes in poor language quality. Caveat, Chinese was quite good. All other languages were, were not that good. And uh, they were quite open about how low resourced they are because they advocated volunteers to join and spread. And thus, because we know that volunteer work is not very sustainable, their um, performance in terms of subscribers, how many subscribers they got to their Telegram channels, was the tops was like uh, 1,500, uh, except one outlier. But all the rest were like really in hundreds, which is not very large uh, followership for Telegram accounts. So bottom line, it's uh, across the European borders, but not only, it spreads elsewhere as well, and the quality of the assets is much lower than we used to see. Thanks a lot, Nika. So whoever entered this room thinking this is a, a bit fuzzy concept, I don't understand it. Now you have very concrete example of how fast and in a way effectively it is produced and the real impact of this beyond the uh, you know, online and social media uh, production process. Lutz, please, uh, your viewpoint on this. Well, another good example, uh, just uh, adding up to what, uh, what Nika said last night, uh, Meta published its uh, quarterly, uh, what they call adversarial threat report. Again, very targeted, very well organized uh, activities uh, in, in that sense in the, in the digital world to mislead, to uh, so mistrust, etc. So very, very clear examples that we have at hand. And what is really the important element in all this is these are not kind of coincidences. These are not uh, activities that are somewhere at the, at the byline. These are very clearly coordinated, targeted, well-planned, well-resourced activities, including by state actors. And that's why we need to take it very, very seriously. When we discussed a long time about the phenomenon about disinformation, and uh, there is a partner in arms here in the, in the room with Paolo Cesarini, we have done a lot of work on unpacking this very, very complex issue. And of course, there are other forms of disinformation, information manipulation that relate to individuals, to political groups that is more kind of a societal problem, maybe, maybe even an economic problem sometimes. But we also, also, and that is the, the element that we are concentrating on, is we have state activities. We have an external state actor that is resourcing this, that is putting money into it, that has the structures deep into the intelligence services. And that's why we need to take it very, very seriously. Because in the end, it's not only a question of the sanity of our online debates or even the information space, it's more. It goes deep into stability of democracies. Yeah, thanks a lot, Lutz. So very important point. So there is a confusion, of course, in the process, but it's coordinated. Again, it's produced, it has a deliberate intent, and there are actors behind it uh, producing the threat. So that's very important points to retain uh, in the threat analysis. Uh, Teja, please. Thank you so much. Uh, I come from the European Center of Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats, and I would like to put uh, this phenomenon of foreign interference into that larger context of, of hybrid threat activities, uh, which certainly are in intentional. Uh, which uh, seek to undermine uh, our uh, democratic values, our stability, our uh, public trust in, 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 in our governance model as well as in, in the, in the, in the govern government. Uh, so uh, if we think about, uh, for instance, election interference, foreign interference into our, our democratic elections, that's where I, I think we find uh, a huge number of examples of also of successful foreign interference. If I think about uh, the current war, Russian war against Ukraine, how that was, uh, how informa the information space uh, in Russia, but also 
more at the international level, was manipulated prior to the war to kind of provide a justification for the war uh, by the uh, arguments about uh, a genocide, a nazification going on. This firm manipulation of the broader information space uh, or the successes of, of the manipulation of the information space can be seen in the current Russian support for the uh, war still existing at the high, high level, but also existing outside Russia. So what we have is a very efficient tool in the uh, toolbox of the adversaries uh, to, uh, to undermine our, our stability and, 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 of course, our democratic values. Uh, so this is where I would uh, like to see in this context the, 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 the foreign interference uh, in, in general. Thanks a lot. And before I uh, move it to Rolf's question, um, just to understand uh, properly, this is, uh, in your assessment, and uh, you know, as far as uh, the discipline is evolving, is a threat that is not contingent you know, on the current uh, war uh, in Ukraine, but it's a broader uh, you know, threat that will also be there in the future, of course, aggravated by the current events, but it's something that we have to look at in the longer perspective. Is that the case? And do you have any uh, comment or things to observe on that? To me? Uh, whoever wants to take the floor. If I can, yeah, first, uh, <laughs> if I I can continue. Like I think this is, uh, this is broader and this is more long term. Mm -hmm. And this, is, uh, this has to be seen in the general context of the, of the geopolitical rivalry about, uh, about the rivalry ongoing, about the current and, and future international order. This is a very cost efficient toolbox to be used for, for uh, not only for authoritarian regimes, but in particular for them to to, 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 to discredit uh, our, our democratic model, but also the, the role of the, the Western actors at the global uh, stage. And I think also it's, uh, it's not a total new phenomenon. It's something that existed for years, for decades, in particular in the Cold War, you know? Uh, we have a name for that. It's called active measures, you know, that were used. So nothing new on that side. But what is new is, let's say, the more sophisticated and digital forms of that. We sometimes tend to say this is just a problem of the digital space. No, it's not. It's a broader problem. But the driver behind is new techniques that have been developed, new possibilities uh, that have been developed in, in that field. And that's why also I think this will stay with us. We need to take it seriously. Yes, we have invested over the past few years, but we are still at the beginning of, of really properly understanding what is going on. And that's why we need to continue to invest in this area. Thanks. Yeah, if, please. If, yeah, just uh, on top of that, I totally agree that it will continue. I totally agree that we take it ser need to take it seriously, but we also need to give us ourselves uh, some credit because why, and as I said, these uh, information manipulation campaigns were made sloppy because it doesn't make sense anymore to invest a lot of time to building these online personas to look authentic and to pretend that you are someone real when everyone already saw these markers that tell that you are actually not. And this is thanks to the uh, pressure, constant pressure on social media platforms to deplatform such foreign interference campaigns. It's thanks to investment, to OSINT collectives, to fact checker initiatives, to all the other media literacy and resilience activities that we did since around 2014. Of, of course, it was slow, but we need to give some credit on that and we need to continue. So it's not that we are on stage zero. We are already like one step farther. We see how it's more difficult to maintain and sustain these campaigns for long. Thanks a lot, Nika. And very sorry, Rod, because this wasn't planned, but I no, think it was please. good to give uh, you know, our audience the idea of the threat and the scale of how long it continues, because we're now you're getting into the policy responses yeah. side. So I think that's perfectly uh, you yeah. know, good introduction to that. So please, floor is yours. Exactly. Uh, thank you, Giovanni. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, so we've seen now some examples of how FEMI is being used to target Europe and also partner countries, neighborhood countries like Ukraine. And Lutz already mentioned the need to take this very seriously because it's a serious threat. And we know the European Union is taking it seriously. It's uh, becoming more and more integrated, the counter FEMI response in European policy, like in the uh, common security and defense uh, policy. And a recent example for this would be what was announced two weeks ago, uh, more European support for 
counter FEMI in operations in Moldova. Uh, so my question to our guests here is, do you think um, what we see, for example, with Moldova, is this a blueprint for how Europe is uh, progressing on this topic and what will be the future for counter FEMI uh, in cooperation with our partner countries uh, in the European neighborhood and abroad, beyond? Uh, I think Lutz maybe is a good starting point here. Good. I mean, we have worked over the past few years on a very important uh, area there, and that is, first of all, to properly understand the threat. Because I think that a lot of myths, a lot of perceptions out there, is it a problem? Is it not a problem? How does it connect? And I think that's why one of our first uh, elements that we are putting in place and that we have put in place is actually to, to circumscribe very, very clearly what we call situational awareness together with the colleagues on the hybrid side, together with the colleagues on the digital side. Because what is the problem of, these, of this type of interference is that there are uh, combinations of different instruments being used in the information space, in the cyberspace, uh, also in the, in the offline space, let's call it like this, with uh, corruption, other forms of, of capture, etc. And all this is, is really important to have facts there, not anecdotal evidence, facts. And I think it's still one of the most under-researched uh, areas, by the way, that uh, since we speak here also at the EUI, um, that we need to invest further. So this is this situational awareness is really hugely important, also for Moldova, for example, because first you need to know what is the nature of the threat, how does it work to be able to respond. And then the responses, I think we need to think in three categories in these responses. The first one is something that people say very often, but I don't think they sometimes understand themselves what it is, is societal resilience. You know? How do you build this? There's many different boxes. I think we'll see a later panel also um, on this issue about media, media awareness, uh, strengthening of the, of the public space in that area, fact checking, uh, uh, etc. But it's hugely important in, in that field. Um, and awareness, understanding of what it is, is really number one. Uh, second point, again, something that is not really my or our work, but uh, is usually important is, if we look at the digital space, is to look at responsibilities, at the accountability, at transparency also in, in this field. I think we'll hear more about this later in another panel. And the third one, and that is where we have invested a lot, is also how do we, uh, and that would answer directly also your question, Rolf, how do we translate this into real action? How do we do this? And I think uh, a crucial form is partly defending, protecting our own societies, but also helping others like Moldova in training, in helping, in putting uh, at their disposal also instruments. Um, and last but not least, of course, uh, also to look at the different instruments that we have in our toolbox, including uh, the famous issue that was just uh, discussed at the main stage of sanctions, for example. I think it's still a very, very important tool that we need to use wisely, targeted. It's not the, the answer to all our questions, but a very, very important tool there. And that's the package that we put together basically for, for Moldova. Say yeah, please. Uh, I think uh, I would like to make an argument uh, about uh, the EU's instruments in support of its uh, its resilience in, in the uh, in support of the resilience of its partner countries because this goal has been there for quite some time. It has been there in the in the global strategy of 2016. It has been there very strongly in the strategic compass. Uh, so the EU wants to support uh, the resilience of its partner countries. That, that's uh, a clear goal. But of course, uh, now the environment is very different. The, the uh, environment in which the EU uh, seeks to support the resilience of its partner countries has changed. And now we have to ask ourselves whether the, in, the EU has to, whether the instruments that the EU has uh, uh, are, are sufficient ones uh, for, for this purpose. Uh, as, as it was mentioned, there are uh, things going on, there are, uh, are uh, kind of uh, new possibilities, uh, but, uh, but still what I think makes the difference is that, that clearly uh, the EU is uh, not building resilience 
in, in, in the way it used to, but, but now it's, it's kind of countering directly the adversarial actors that, that, uh, that seek to undermine the resilience of the, of the partner countries. Uh, so it, it requires a new uh, approach, at least the EU needs to consider whether those, those old instruments, that whether the instruments it has at its disposal are, are sufficient for, for this a much more strategic approach needed. We are in a, in a new situation in, in Moldova where, of course, Russia tries to polarize uh, the country, uh, undermine uh, support for the, for the current uh, pro-European regime. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that's the environment where, where the EU has to kind of uh, support its own values and its partnership with, the, with, with, with Moldova. So this is a very challenging situation. Yeah. If I may add, so if one of the instruments that we consider is uh, financing initiatives that uh, do open source and, um, and, and try to follow the trend, because we know with emergence of AI, there will be larger, uh, the, this information will be produced at larger scale. Part of the requirements for such initiatives should be inter and cross border teams. Uh, and I can really share experience of the Digital Forensic Research Lab. We are really, we like to think about ourselves as really global. I have colleagues in Latin America, in South Africa, used to have colleagues in Southeast Asia, as of recently also covering MENA region. And of course, so information influence campaigns, they are global, especially with Russia now, who has mastered their uh, blueprint and toolbox for a long, long time. Uh, they will poke into different parts of the world to see what responds and how, how they can use it and, and push, put pressure on, say, the Western countries. So uh, such teams need to be international. We need to have this 360 whole globe perspective on what is happening. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so now we've seen more the outside approach against this topic. Uh, I think Giovanni will now take it back inside the European Union. And uh, Yeah, thanks a lot, Rolf. Knowing that from what has been said in the previous panel, I think the resilience beat is absolutely critical. And we were writing, Nadia, remember this policy brief about hybrid threats in Africa. And we were thinking, okay, global strategy says building resilience in countries and societies. And it has been the case previously with almost you know, no geopolitical variable uh, intervening in this uh, calculation, then at some point we realize, oh, yes, there is interference. There is manipulation of the information environment. So that comes back to the question of how you actually can fulfill that objective of building resilience in the presence of these threats. And that justifies a strong strategic justification for those responses and for better preparation and awareness. But now let us go back to the classic question when it comes to EU external action, which is the coherence, the consistency of EU instruments and of EU member states strategies and approaches. So here, of course, we have a number of initiatives that have been done in think tanks and uh, other uh, research organizations debates about the topic of FEMI. It's not entirely new, but you know, the discipline is evolving at the same time. So there is a there is a growing dynamism in that. So the key question here is, how do we ensure that consistency and that unity of action that will make basically results on the ground possible uh, according to the desired strategic needs? How do we ensure that uh, sort of integrated approach as part of FEMI? And specifically with some policy areas that are particularly crucial. Think about the digital, but think about also other uh, factors. Uh, maybe here, Teja, you want to start, uh, and also bringing in perspectives from other organizations as well that operate in this area, and then Lutz and Nika, please. If, if I, I put FEMI into the larger co context of countering hybrid threats, because that is the larger framework, we can say that, uh, of course, the EU has a lot of tools at its disposal. It has legislative tools, it has political tools, tools different types of early warning mechanisms, it has... Uh, kind of provides platform for sharing of best practices among the member states. But how do we, of these different tools, which are based on different uh, legal bases, different competencies, different uh, divisions of, of uh, competence between the EU and, and the member states, how do we, from these, create a, an integrated unitary response that can be activated 
if, for instance, there is a major hybrid threat attack against the European Union, which consists of several components, as they tend to be, there might be a cyber attack, there might be a heavy manipulation of the information space, there might be attacks against critical infrastructures, and then the EU would need to kind of use its uh, instruments to, to address all of them in a, in a, a coherent, integrated manner. I think this is the question, this is the key question. What I see now, uh, I, I have to admit that a lot of things have been done since uh, mainly 2016 when this pro these processes have been intensifying uh, in, in terms of creating resilience. I see different uh, uh, processes that can be, be, be possible depending on the, uh, on the nature of the crisis or the, or the uh, operation. Uh, but but the, the problem, the question of coherence is, is still, still there and needs to be addressed. So FEMI is one of those uh, uh, things uh, on, on the table. Uh, there are cyber diplomacy, uh, pro, the cyber diplomacy process. There is the kind of um, uh, hybrid toolbox. Uh, there is the general crisis responses mechanism. So <laughs> this is typical of the European Union that there are that there are several things going on at the same time. Uh, so I, I very much agree with the. Uh, with the proposal coming from the European uh, Parliament's uh, co special committee that there needs to be a, an integrated uh, response possibility. Thank you, Teja. Uh, Lutz, I mean, answering to this, but also to something that Teja was mentioning, if there is a hybrid attack tomorrow, um, I mean, if there was a cyber attack, there is a coordination system in place at the strategic, at the political, operational, and technical levels. But a hybrid attack, uh, that will be a bit, a bit more difficult uh, in that respect. So can you please also address that maybe in your response about the coherence? So what if uh, you know, there is uh, an attack? What are the responses uh, that are currently available and where are we heading to? No, I think we made huge progress in this field also structurally um, with uh, giving us these toolboxes, with giving us these processes in having specific mechanisms also in the, in the council, for example. Uh, we have for the information uh, space or for FEMI issues, we have a rapid alert system. So all these things have been created in a very short time frame. And I don't think uh, we should be too overly critical. Of course, there's still a long way to go and there, there are many missing elements, but we made a huge, huge kind of way ahead already. But maybe there's one thing I would like to put a nuance uh, to what you said, Teja, and that is we speak about attacks very often. The problem is that a lot of these things are structurally, you know, they are under the level of an event. Uh, many of the member states always ask us in our discussions, you know, so what is the mechanism in case of an attack? I say the attacks are happening every day. It's happening every moment, you know. So we need also to invest structurally in this. And maybe the difficulty that we are facing, and it's not an unsurmountable, but the difficulty that we are facing is not only what Thea just said with different perspectives and different structures that exist in the member states. It also falls in very different policy areas. It is, if we look at the disinformation element, it's a communication element, yes. But it's also a digital policy uh, issue. It's a security policy issue. It's a foreign policy issue. It's an education policy issue. And you see just by this enumeration of these very, very eclectic, uh, not eclectic, but this wide range of, of areas that a lot of our structures, including at European level, of course, are trying to piece this together in the, in the right way. So what the European Parliament did in calling for more coherence and pushing this is absolutely right, absolutely spot on. But it's not that we have been sitting idle on our hands, you know, and, and not doing anything about this. The missing element for me at the moment is a proper a debate also at societal level, how important this, this threat is or not. Because sometimes we still have a debate, um, and if I can just kind of refer to, to disinformation kind of events, you know, people say, they think, oh, this is just a hostile narrative, not a problem. We just need to communicate and everything is fine. It is not. There is a structural issue behind. There is a state actor. There is an intention. There is a, a targeted and coordinated activity. And that is something we need to, we need to, to do. 
I'm talking especially to the uh, EUIE uh, audience here, I think it's a formidable issue for a multidisciplinary uh, approach area where you need to look at these different elements, all these little parts of the pie, and piece it together because that is how it works, unfortunately. Yeah, so important to bring research and policy together, especially Absolutely. on this team. Thanks a lot, Lutz, please. Yeah, just to add, uh, I believe that one of the key elements for consistent response is sense of urgency. We saw how effective where was decision-making to sanction Russia much more harshly than the beta before the invasion at the time when it happened. There was really great unity that no one expected. And so, uh, and that's the main element that Lutz also mentioned, is the very scattered approach with hybrid, uh, hybrid operations. It pokes here, it pokes there, and there is no real sense of urgency that is Europe-wide, right? Because, okay, something is happening in Bulgaria, you can disregard, oh, it's just their internal matter. Something happens in cyber domain, no one even sees it, right? Because, yeah, we are under constant attack, but we don't have the sense of urgency because our services are doing well. And also, in this interdisciplinary approach, it's very hard for people to unite especially if everyone has their own agenda, if there is no sense of urgency. So uh, sustaining the debate and creating the sense of urgency that, hey, they are pursuing with their goals, uh, and the longer we are just like tolerating it, the farther they get with their goals. So I believe that that's one of the key elements to achieve consistent response and also effective response. Thanks a lot, Nika, and indeed. Don't expect the incident. The threat is digging, and at some point, if nothing is done at the structural level, also as Lutz was saying, everything is likely to collapse. So Harris, here is the urgency element. Uh, I would like to start taking questions uh, from the audience, so please prepare to raise your hand if you have anything you would like uh, to discuss. Be, uh, before I do that, I see that there are three people. Just one request for Nadia to please uh, tell us, because you provided the opening remarks, so is there anything that struck your attention in this? Uh, also, probably, where do other organizations like NATO fall into this picture? Uh, talking about you, NATO cooperation, for instance. Just very quick before I get to the audience, please. Yeah, thank you, and thank you to everyone uh, uh, for your remarks and your comments. Uh, I find it very interesting, and it's also fantastic to see such an interest in the room in these topics. And, I just want to comment on the urgency, the daily issue is beyond the elections, it's beyond the hybrid warfare, but indeed the stakes are very high today. There is a war on the borders of the EU in Ukraine led by Russia. It's a hybrid warfare. There is an increasingly assertive behavior of China in the public spheres in the digital space and beyond. There are democracy stakes very high beyond countering foreign interference. Democracy cannot be taken for granted and better we build societal resilience as well as also Lutz and other speakers mentioned, stronger we are to counter any type of manipulation and preserve our democratic values and principles. So the stakes are very high. What is new, we discussed what is new, what is old. This has been a very long ongoing issue. Well, the new is, not only the scope and the tools, but the exposure as well. Now we are raising the awareness, we are exposing it much more that helps to build resilience, but we cannot do it only during the times of elections or three, six months before. We have to be doing this on a daily basis as the, as the adversaries are doing it on a daily basis and using all kinds of toolboxes. It's great we are developing the FEMI toolbox, having hybrid toolbox, cyber diplomacy <laughs> toolbox. But all of this needs to be, as you said as well, Giovanni, perhaps considering what also other partners are doing, be it institutions such as NATO or, or UN or uh, other, other institutions, but also countries. So I think what is very important is that we do have a lot of evidence by now, we need to raise more awareness, perhaps with the citizens, but not only that they know, but they also know what to do when they encounter this information, or what to do when they fall for it, and how do you go back? How do you bounce back? So I think these are the questions that we need to consider from not only top-down approach, bottom-up. We are talking a lot in this field of whole of society approach, transnational approach, engaging different actors, different stakeholders states, but also non-state actors. And I think this is a societal issue that needs to be really taken into consideration the individuals because they are going to vote and they are ultimately going to fight in the war and they do right now. So I think the stakes are very high, therefore the costs are high. We discussed sanctions, there are many other tools. I think that's, that's important to think of all kinds of tools we can use, cooperate, engage, 
and maybe also have some new innovative ideas. So I'm looking forward to the questions as well. Great, thank you, Nadia. So uh, there was a question uh, from there, if I'm correct, and please raise your hand so that I can see you. Okay, uh, we'll take uh, two or three for the first round, please, gentlemen there. Uh, if you can introduce yourself as well, thanks. Um, yes, hi, uh, I'm Mark Hilsen, with German diplomat, uh, was say for 10 years, kind of Mr. CSDP in Berlin, the hybrid focal point and others. So I worked a lot on these issues. I very much agree with all you said, but I just wanted to, we always talk about these kind of structures, how to manage this complexity, sense of urgency. Uh, um, in the end, it's about people. And I, I want to break it down to something very simple. People have to talk with people. Commission people have to talk with council people. Uh, or uh, about consistency. Uh, how do we do this abroad? If, if uh, no, the head of mission uh, of CCP is even not talking to the EU delegation. Uh, on a, and so it really boils down to, to as well this very simple thing. So I, the question basically is how much about kind of the more people-to-people -people mindset we need for that, and how much just of the structures and toolboxes and all those things is what we Germans love to organize. No? So I would put a lot more perhaps, effort on the other things. So to, as you say, it's teams. How do you create the spirit that military talks with uh, civilian security cyber guys, and how do we create this spirit? This would be my well, more common than question. Thanks a lot. The Countering Foreign Interference Project aims partly to address that question by creating a community of practice uh, around the topic of FIMI. We can discuss later, but I want to move on to uh, two other questions. Uh, here, please, and then gentlemen there. Um, hi, my name is Idan from uh, Reichmann University. Um, as I said, there is a crucial distinction between um, foreign influence and foreign interference. So my question is, how does the EU uh, see this uh, difference between those uh, definitions? And who and, and what should we do with this difference? Should be more should we be more specific or more legislated? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, maybe another one there. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jan Paul Brouwer. I'm director of HR at the EUI. Um, not an expert in this topic at all. Um, but I have a question out of uh, general curiosity. Um, we see that in the workplace, artificial intelligence is really changing really everything. And there's an enormous surge. And in the coming months, we see there are big, big, big changes. Now, already artificial intelligence in the hands of the good, good people is something that I would see as a very challenging development. Um, how about artificial intelligence in the hands of, let's say, not the good guys and the bad guys? I love that question. Thanks. Uh, so let's uh, start answering. Uh, please be brief because uh, we don't have uh, much time and maybe there could be space for one or two very last questions. So uh, maybe Nika, you want to start and then we... Yeah, the maybe I will start with the last question because yes. I feel that I have something to say. So even if people have bad intentions, they also need to be smart about the use of AI because so far what we've seen, if you just plug say, chat GPT into your disinformation automation system, as we learned from Vulcan files, uh, and you just uh, query uh, chat GPT to produce um, narratives, oftentimes chat GPT will say, I'm just an AI, but if I were a person, I would say that. And so these sentences are still there. And that's another marker that we see on Twitter, like just these exact words, I am an AI module. And, and you see a tons of such like uh, sloppy created uh, uh, tweets. So I mean, there's still, the bad guys also need, need to advance because this technological development is also, well, maybe they were looking into that direction, but at least, I mean, the scale is also not there for them. Just to answer, yeah, and we'll, we'll see how it develops further. But so far there are markers that help us to tell manipulation apart. Okay. Uh, I would like to get back to, to your question. Uh, I think uh, it's, a, it's a question of attitude, uh, that a new attitude that, that is, is requ required. Uh, the European Union needs to be able to better uh, identify its vulnerabilities. And vulnerabilities also deal with, also, also we create 
uh, in the European Union. We are creating our own vulnerabilities. So if people don't talk to each other, if people kind of uh, compete, we, uh, we have this competition about uh, competencies, who does what. This is, this is all uh, creating vulnerabilities to, to the hands of the adversaries. So I think by raising this better awareness about that we might create vulnerabilities by, by behaving stupidly, <laughs> I, I hope that we could kind of foster a more, more cooperative and collective spirit, at least uh, a willingness, better willingness to, to address these, these uh, vulnerabilities that we, that we create. Uh, foreign uh, interference and, and influence, we don't uh, that much uh, emphasize that distinction uh, at the hybrid COE. Uh, however, I think that uh, what this distinction brings to our discussion that we have, have not touched upon yet is the time perspective. Uh, because uh, as, as it was mentioned, we, we need uh, structures, but we need also a better uh, capability to address these, more, these uh, threats uh, and forms of foreign uh, interference or influence that function on, on a more long-term uh, Basis. So we, we call that priming. Uh, you were referring to our, our, the system of domains that we, the, we created in our conceptual model, but we also have this, these different phases for hybrid set activities. Why not also for, for, for influ influencing uh, in, or information operations? So, so and, and the priming phase is, is the most uh, difficult one because then we don't know what might come out of that. So when we see a hybrid threat operation, when we see an influencing operation, we, it's easy to recognize it. But if, 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 if kind of preparing the ground for a later operation is happening, how do we recognize that? And how do we find the right tools to, to address that? Uh, but but uh, I, I, I recommend that's an, uh, that would be a perfect uh, question for a, a more academic study. Perhaps you are, <laughs> you are, you are doing that. So what's the distinction how we, and, and how do we dis uh, kind of uh, differentiate in policy terms uh, uh, foreign interference and, and, and influencing? And if you are doing that study, let's keep in touch. Because it will be most interesting <laughs> to discuss. Luz, please. Well, maybe on this point, I mean, there is a fine balance between uh, influence in, an, in a legitimate way. It's called public diplomacy, you know? We are doing this every day um, and others want to do. You want to influence. Uh, but the question is, where do you draw the line? I think we have a few cases where it's pretty clear. If it's malign activities, if it's covert activities, etc. You have a whole list of, of these things. But in the end, in real life, it doesn't help us to draw really kind of a very clear distinction. There's always a bit of a gray zone where things are not illegal, uh, but maybe illegitimate, etc. And we have that, of course, very much in this FEMI area. Because what we are seeing is that people, and we don't even know whether it's people, but something is out there, and it is not illegal. You know, you can say whatever you want. You can lie. There is no law that prevents you from lying. So how do you want to do this? You know, so you need to, to think kind of indirectly in this one. And the other point I wanted to make, yes, the EU is very good in creating structures. Once a structure is there, it's happening. It's not only the EU, also the member states, by the way. Structures will never <coughs> replace people, etc. But where does it need to start? It needs to start exactly at the sense of urgency among uh, politicians and policy makers, etc., to see uh, kind of under the motto, Houston, we have a problem, you know? Um, and I'm not sure we are there yet. I'm not sure we are, we are there yet. And I think we need to, uh, and that is reality, we are seeing these events developing. We are seeing it happening. I think COVID was a good eye-opener, how it works. Uh, since the 24th of February, we are seeing a surge of these activities. Um, and we see these revelations, take the Vulcan files, take Team Jorge uh, revelations, etc. Many other things, you know, that Thea and her team and many others are doing. I think this, uh, this awareness will then trickle down in, in uh, let's say, more activities. But for that, you need the structures. So we need to think about these two things. And one additional element I forgot to say. We are seeing enormous developments at the level of member states. Look at Sweden that has created a specific agency or revived an old agency. France has created new structures, including a specific 
uh, research, the Viginum, you know, in, in this area. Um, many other member states are doing this. And we need to be clear that we connect these activities. Um, I mean, my team is doing what it can, but it doesn't have the mandate to do this. I think this is maybe the next kind of discussion that we need to have in the future. How many arms do you need to connect the whole of Europe? <laughs> A lot of them. More than two. <laughs> Thanks, Lutz. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think we have time for two more questions. Very brief ones, please. Uh, Eva. Thank you very much. My name is Ivan Enadic. I'm a research fellow at the European University Institute working with the Center for Media Pluralism and Media Freedom, and I also work on policy research and analysis for the European Digital Media Observatory. Uh, I have two questions, but I will make them very brief. One is, how do we work around the fact that one of the key bad actors in the problem of disinformation and FEMI are politicians and state actors? And at the same time, we have this paradoxical situation in which we expect them to provide solutions to these problems? This is the first question. Second question is, you mentioned Moldova. Uh, I was wondering what, whether there was any specific consideration of another European region, which is very fragile in terms of peacekeeping. It's also, it's been historically on the crossroad of different influences and, uh, and foreign influences in particular. And I'm speaking of former Yugoslav countries here, where we also have member states and candidate countries mixing, so the the, the impact of policies that are being designed for EU member states perhaps doesn't actually reach the other states in the region. And the fact is that there is a common linguistic area. So the, there is a common language, which means that the information sphere is shared. So how do we address these issues, for example? Thank you. Okay. I think those are two questions already. <laughs> so, and we don't have much time left. So uh, please, if my, our guest could answer. Um, Shall I kick off? Um, yeah, sure. Because that's, uh, uh, I mean, two very important questions. The first one is, yes, that's exactly the issue in disinformation where things go wrong because uh, people think, ah, but that is a uh, part of a normal discourse, you know, in a, political, in a political environment. It's just a little bit more robust. And that's why we need to distinguish these things very, very clearly from each other. Disinformation is a very un unsuitable term, in my view, because it mixes everything. Everybody has a different understanding. I think we discussed about strategic autonomy yesterday. You know, it's, it's some of these terms, it's just kind of uh, not very helpful for the debate because everybody comes from a different perspective. I would like to distinguish kind of these domestic issues that we have in the sanity of the debate and the way this is using from a hostile activity, coordinated, finance structured of an external, of an external actor. And sometimes they overlap and that is the problem. But uh, that's why let's keep things a little bit apart. And that's hence also my, my call on, on research, on academic, etc. We need further work on, in this field. Otherwise, there is total confusion. And I can only agree, the Western Balkans is one of our focal areas. You need a lot of resources uh, to do this. And you need, of course, also here to distinguish. There are a lot of domestic uh, and regional, uh, let's say, dynamics in this field. Uh, there are also external actors, uh, and that makes it quite a, uh, let's say, a, uh, a complex kind of area. But one of the answers is really to strengthen civil society in this field, to strengthen the resilience. And that is what we are doing at the moment. At least my team that is dealing with the Western Balkans is really investing in these media literacy programs, investing in, in this field. It's not the solution to everything, but it's one of the building blocks that we need to put in place. Thank you. Uh, uh, I think your question uh, leads us back to, to, to also one of, uh, one, of uh, a, one, one general question that we need to ad address to, to kind of uh, uh, assess the EU's uh, uh, capability to address hybrid threats, and it's about uh, its, its uh, strategic communication. Because we see in Western Balkans, we see in, in the neighborhood a lot of uh, narratives uh, where hostile actors are, are creating the narrative for the European Union. They are presenting the European Union in, 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 in a light that is, of course, not beneficial for the EU itself. And in this competition, the EU must be stronger. But it's... it's uh, so it's not only about a kind of a narrow addressing of, 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 of information operations. It's a, it's a larger question about the EU's possibility to communicate its values, its assets, 
uh, and uh, the reasons for, for its existence. Uh, and in this game, I think, uh, uh, the EU needs to, to strengthen it, it itself. Uh, uh, and, and kind of find, because otherwise uh, some, someone else is explaining uh, the European Union. This, this is going, we yesterday talked about the Global South, that's where the competition is, is ongoing. So there are many theaters where the EU would, would need to be much stronger in its strategic communication. It would also need to communicate its, its resilience to the, to the hybrid threat actors, actors that want to, want to challenge the EU. So, so I want to conclude on, on this message. Thanks a lot and a very important one, Teja. We have been instructed to finish the panel a bit earlier due to operational reasons. So thanks a lot to you and to all speakers for the active participation. Uh, there was a strong call for links between policy and research. EYSS, through the Countering Foreign Interference Project, is precisely working into that direction as well, besides providing the contributing to the policy tools. So do not hesitate to get in touch with Nadia, myself, and with Rolf. EY is a partner in the project. Thanks a lot, and have a nice continuation of the State of the Union.